Uh, TEP inguinal hernia repair avoid complications is the title. Can we get the slides? Um, so I'm going to skip over some things because Jorge gave such a great lecture on the ten uh, on on the critical view and the ten steps, uh, and he showed great TEP video. So we'll skip through some of the videos, and that will save a little bit of time. But why TEP? Um, I think that TEP, if you learn a TEP and you're comfortable doing TEP, honestly is an unbeatable operation. Nothing is faster. You don't have to close the peritoneum. Uh, you don't violate the peritoneum. And it definitely, it's a really efficient operation. I think that, you know, as in the U.S., a lot of it has switched over to robotics. But I just can't get myself to do a, to do a robotic plain inguinal because it can't beat a TEP. It's just so much faster to do a TEP. Um, so what are the advantages of MIS repair? I think we know these things faster, return to work, less wound complications, small incisions. You can address both sides. It's perfect for bilateral. Uh, but I think the key to MIS surgery is that it's the, it's, if you have one hammer, that's the hammer that you want because it addresses all anatomy, femoral, obturator, indirect, direct hernias, uh, and even low-lying spigelian. So uh, lower acute and chronic pain sense and sensory disturbances, and you can avoid the scarred plane and reoperative surgery. What are the disadvantages? So we talked about this in Liechtenstein. It uses general anesthesia. The, the learning curve is the key, is that it's more difficult to master, that once you master it, it's yours, and it's your, you know, it's such a great operation, but to get there, it's hard, and we've spent so much time teaching, you know, uh, the residents, we teach the residents, we, we know that it takes them a lot, of, most residents, when they finish, I don't think are really perfect at doing an MIS repair, they need to spend the time to learn to master that on their own as well, and uh, in the international world, when we teach for the charity, it's, it's really hard, we spent years going back with the same surgeons to get them to get to that level. Uh, there is potential for visceral and vascular injury. You just are not going to get that kind of injury in a Liechtenstein, and I'll, I'll show you some of the examples of that. And complications, if you have, you know, folded mesh or if you have pain, it's more challenging to remediate uh, preperitoneal repair. Uh, and it can be difficult in the reoperative field when you have a prostatectomy or a lower abdominal surgery. So we know the guidelines show us that uh, if we have the expertise, and that's the key, MIS techniques are recommended. So where should we be as modern hernia surgeries? We should have TEP in our toolbox, TAP in our toolbox, open. I go back and forth between TEP, ETEP, and TAP all the time. Just so, you know, if, he, if I need to tap it, I tap it. If I, if I can tap it, it saves me one step. But to be able to go back and forth and to open, you want to be able to have where, where is a benefit to you. So when we talk about TEP versus TAP, and you really look at it, it's learning curve is higher for TEP because it's the anatomy, especially for a resident looking at it the first time, is not as intuitive. That when you look at it, you're not seeing it from the inside where the relationship of your intra-abdominal cavity is very clear. And then also, the, you, you can see that um, this, the, it's a little longer with operative time for TAP. Cost is a little more with TEP, especially if you use a balloon. Uh, Jorge with ETEP has really changed that to make it that uh, we can cut a lot of that cost down. Um, and so when we talk about this, I, I can skip a lot of this as well because uh, Jorge gave that great lecture. But this is the problem is that TEP and TAP and MIS repairs are really difficult just because the anatomy was challenging. And it really was because of uh, Ed Felix in the U.S. and Reinhard Bittner here in Europe. Uh, and with Jorge and, and Ed publishing, it really made a difference. And this is how the posterior elements were understood in 1920. This is uh, Chadel's book here. You can see this is how they drew the anatomy. And this is kind of the... the 10 golden rules, uh, uh, the Brazilians you know, kind of codified the same critical view in this kind of inverted Y with five triangles. But this is what we're looking for. We want to define this myopectoneal orifice. We want to identify the areas of caution, triangle of doom, triangle of pain. And we want to, in these cases also, as, as Jorge mentioned, you want to think about the nerves. That Remember, when you say, I just put three tacks, or I put five tacks, or I put less than 10 tacks. The problem is you don't know exactly where they exit, and there's a lot of variation. So I always tell people that when you talk about pain, there's only one freebie, and that's a tack on Cooper's ligament or a suture on Cooper's ligament, but everything else has risk. The less you use, the, the better, though. So uh, David gave some great lectures on this already, so we know that the nerves, when you think about laparoscopic surgery, you think about the genitofemoral, genital and femoral branch, and the lateral femocutaneous. The femoral nerve proper runs and should be protected by the psoas. But, so you see, see these nerves here, there's variation, lateral femocutaneous, two branches, femoral branch. And then you just saw uh, this same description that we need to understand that there's two layers of that preperitoneal space. And I think that David Laurier shows that so well with the robotic anatomy, but that we understand that there's 
a parietal compartment next to the wall where the nerves live, and the visceral compartment, that pre, the true preperitoneal plane. And why is that relevant? Well, here you can see, okay, this is going to be the parietal compartment is here against the naked muscle. So medial to the inferior epigastric, we want to be in the parietal. Lateral, you want to be in the visceral. So that, that transversalis fascia, that intermembranous septum, that intermediate fascia, whatever you want to call it, is protecting your nerves. So here when I do a neurectomy, we do retroperitoneal neurectomies, you can see here genitofemoral covered by the psoas. This is the investing transversalis fascia. But if I go into the retroperitoneum directly when I'm doing a neurectomy, you see, see these nerves are naked here. So if you think about that, that. If you put the mesh here, no problem, just like a Liechtenstein, it's covered by fascia. But if you put the mesh here, it will irritate the nerves, and the patients will get some pain because of that, just because of that inflammatory reaction. And here you can see this is genital nerve right against a piece of mesh here, and you know we, we've dealt with pain patients for, um, you know, I've probably uh, operated on about 750 pain patients. So when we say what goes wrong, we know every variation of that. So the TEP learning curve, so we don't need to talk about these things because Jorge talked about it, but this critical view of the myopectineal orifice, for all of your residents, when you're teaching people, this is probably what we want to do for all MIS surgery to just say we have this codified thing. But when you go through all this anatomy, sometimes you say, honestly, it's too much. It's too much, right? You know, your residents are going to scratch their heads and say, I don't get it. They just need to understand something as simple as this, that you just need to say, you need to see the direct, the indirect, the femoral space. You need to understand that the nerves run here. The iliopubic tract is this, and I tell them that this is like a watch. It's like a clock face, that the center of it, inferior epigastric comes here, and you want this myopectineal orifice to be addressed. You want to have where this view is like a watch. And so if you have this view, then you say, okay, I have an adequate landing zone for the mesh, and I can cover and take care of direct, indirect, femoral, obturator, everything, and that the peritoneum needs to be below that, okay? So for a TEP in particular, we talk about access in the skin incision, uh, and so you can access that retromuscular, the retrorectus plane. Uh, you can use a balloon. You can do it uh, just with aerodissection. ETEP has really showed us that, but you're going to get into this plane, and here's the, this is the normal balloon version of this, that we use a balloon to dissect this, and uh, CO2. This is what the picture that you want to go for is, but uh, when we talk about vascular anatomy, uh, as David mentioned and as Jan Kukleta mentioned, it's very, very reliable that there's always inferior epigastric, there's a crosser at the top to the rectus, and there's a crosser at the bottom. They're always there. Sometimes there's a third one, and then there's a corona mortis in some patients, but you just have to recognize, okay, if I bleed, where is it going to bleed from? And this is why it's relevant when you're blowing up this balloon. If you blow this up, I tell the residents five pumps and stop. So if you see inferior epigastric up, you're okay. If you see inferior epigastric down, stop pumping, you know, because the thing is that you're going to have problems with what will happen. Well, you're going to get bleeding from those two branches are going to evulse, and you're going to put your mesh in the wrong plane. So that's, that tells you that same compartment, the visceral and the parietal, the, the pre-transversalis and pre-peritoneal plane. So steps one through four, you know, Jorge showed a lot of these things that we want to do the medial dissection. So I don't need to show this video, but we're going to get to Cooper's ligament. And then the lateral dissection, Jorge's going to, I'm sure, show videos on the ETEP as well. But on the lateral, what are your pitfalls? You want to say, okay, on the medial dissection, my pitfalls are, I want to think about corona mortis, okay? On your lateral dissection, you say, I want to think about, uh, so you want to be pre-peritoneal, not pre-transversalis. And otherwise, you risk nerve injury, it's bloodier, and then you can put the mesh in the wrong compartment, okay? So in the lateral dissection, this is the most difficult part of the dissection. You want to stay posterior to the inferior epigastrics. You want to look for the lateral down wall and avoid those structures. So this is the lateral dissection, and Jorge showed you. You just want to get all the way back so you have an adequate landing zone that is parietalized and you see the psoas, okay? The exploration of the cord, you want to dissect the sac and peritoneum. As Jan showed you, you never need to touch the cord itself. You just need to, it's all about the track with the sac. So indirect sac is always anterior medial, lipomas are anterior lateral, the vas is posterior medial, and the cord is lateral. So sac dissection, we don't need to spend time on this because you saw good videos of that, uh, but you want to identify and reduce all cord lipomas. Cord lipomas, yes, they're not hernias in the sense that you're not going to have incarceration and strangulation, but to a patient, it's a hernia. If you leave behind a cord lipoma and they have a bulge, they're not going to like you. They're going to say, you didn't fix my hernia. So reduce the cord lipomas. And you saw great pictures of it, but I'll show you this here. That the, What's the difference between a cord lipoma and this? So Jorge showed you that the cord lipoma 
comes from a broad base from the retroperitoneum. This here is lobulated. So this is nodal fat. When you get nodal fat, don't dissect it because it will, it's lymphadenopathy, it will bleed. But that's how you can tell. It's circular and lobular instead of coming from the retroperitoneum. Okay, so uh, dissect the peritoneum laterally. You need to have an adequate landing zone. What are the pitfalls? Sometimes you'll have a low arcuate line, and Jorge showed great pictures of that, of he just divides that once you identify the peritoneal reflection. Okay, eight and nine, uh, mesh deployment and fixation. Minimal mesh size, 10 by 15. Don't slit your mesh. People want to slit their mesh. You don't need to slit your mesh. There's no reason to do it. You know, you've seen Jan Kukleta do this for his whole career. He's never slit the mesh. There's no need. What happens is people wanted to replicate a Liechtenstein. They felt that we'll split the mesh. The problem is that all mesh, except for, as Philip will tell you, uh, Dynamesh doesn't really contract, but all meshes otherwise contract. And when they contract, they'll constrict the cord structures, and people will then say, I have more testicular pain. So no need to slit the mesh. The other thing is that when I do mesh removals, I probably removed about 20 pieces pieces of slip mesh, it's not very fun because it wraps your cord. So uh, anatomic or flat's your choice. Uh, this was slip mesh, this is how they described it before. You know, try to minimize all the tack fixation. Um, but this is how it was described, you know, so, but we didn't know any better. So mesh deployment, this is a video of, um, with a piece of ProGrip, but uh, um, here, this is the key. You just want to have wide dissection, complete coverage, uh, and I like to always take a little peek. I put a little five millimeter optical trocar right through the poster sheet, and I like to see how it sits, because if your mesh is folded, or if you're clamshelled, there's no better time to fix it than that very first day. And the problem with a tap, uh, as opposed to a tap, is that you actually don't know how it's really gonna sit, because you don't have the intra-abdominal insufflation. So I like to take a little peek inside. Um, round ligament, what do we do for women? If you divide the round ligament uh, at this level, there's no nerves here. No, the genital nerve meets at the internal ring, and the ilioinguinal nerve meets on the, in, in, on the anterior canal. So in a Lichtenstein, if you cut the round ligament, you're going to give a woman numbness. So we try not to do that. But in, the, in a laparoscopic repair, you divide it. Where should you divide it? Here, here, as close to the peritoneum as possible, because then you won't have, if it bleeds and it retracts, you don't want to have to chase it into the canal. So if you divide the round ligament, use cautery. The artery of Samson is in the round ligament. So just use some cautery, cut it, and uh, then female hernias are always the nicest because the mesh will always sit flat. What's the nice thing about TEP? You can use TEP to do other types of hernia repairs. So we've learned so much from Jorge, uh, from ETEP. We did neurectomies that way. We do ventral hernias. We turn it around and do uh, suprapubic docking, and we'd go and we'd go up and do ventrals and then TARS. So really, TEP is a great operation for because it can be expanded to ETEP. So what about complications? So we always want to talk about the worst case scenario, not the best case scenario. So recurrence and pain, we always talk about, but infection, less than 1%. Bleed. These are low frequency events, right? But when they happen, they're not so fun. So here's a patient that had TEPS, and uh, they said, oh, this is just seroma. But every time they sucked it out, it was pus. And so uh, if, it's, if there's fluid around mesh, it's not seroma. It's going to be uh, infection if it's delayed except once in a while it is seroma. So this is a patient of mine that I did a TEP on, woman, easy surgery, and she came back uh, two weeks later and she said, oh, I have so much swelling. It's like, oh, okay, so we got this study and you see how much of a seroma is, because you're against the lymphatics, sometimes you get unlucky and you'll get a lymphatic leak. And so here we went back in, you can see it's filled, that's not her bladder, that's with a catheter in. I suctioned that all out. You can see how, uh, this was actually uh, seven days out, but you see how well the mesh is already integrated in there. So I just put a drain, uh, suctioned it out, and then it sealed, went, went away. But this I put, you know, when I was the president of the AHS, I wrote this article about this patient is my patient. This is from a TEP, and this is my, not only is my patient, is my friend, and the dean of the medical school uh, did a TEP, you know, he, he came in, he's all, oh, okay, I want a hernia repair, I'm a pretty older guy, and he, and he said, I want a hernia repair, I like, I want to do minimally invasive to go, go faster, so I did a TEP on him, and uh, so five days later, he had a little ileus, and then we admitted him, and then this, this is what happened, so when we looked at it, this is the original operation, everything looks fine. This is the surgery, here's the deployment of mesh, everything looks great. Uh, I take a look from the inside and I always take a little peek. That's the surgery, everything looked great. So what happened? Well, when I went back, uh, I had to go in, I did a right hemicolectomy. What happened is he had, um, 
So you see this. Uh, and when I look back, this is his colon, had been sewn into his lateral wall because he had an appendectomy. I didn't even think about it because, you know, he, but he had, uh, I'll show you here, he had this incision laterally. This incision was from his appy. He said, I almost died when I was a young man. I had an appendectomy and they did, an, uh, they did this extended transverse incision. So with a tap, just the balloon dropping it down, put some shear on the colon. And so then uh, that's what I had to fix. So happens to everybody that we all can have complications. So never throw stones at anybody else because then it, when it comes to get you, it will really get you. So, uh, but when we talk about, you know, same things of this data, TEP and TAP, minimal differences, they all uh, are great. So advantages of TEP over TAP though, less operative time, you don't have to close the peritoneum and you don't have uh, the risk of incisional hernias. Okay, so tips for MIS, as you saw, uh, understand posterior anatomy, understand the preperitoneal space, know the extent of your dissection and think about your nerves. Thanks so much.